The Pokemon trading card game was a unique way to experience Pokemon. If you got into Pokemon in the 90s, it was likely either through the cards themselves or the anime, which went hand in hand. The trading cards were extremely accessible in a way that the video games just weren't. While the Game Boy games were expensive and required expensive hardware and a level of game literacy to enjoy, the trading cards were cheap, easy to get lots of, and easy to enjoy whether or not you even learned how to play the card game. Most kids at my school didn't ever learn how to play, but it didn't matter. Just having the card, with some awesome artwork of a Pokemon in a realistic location as if it were a photograph taken on a safari, and getting to see some big numbers like HP and damage on their attacks was enough for us. Cards with high numbers were strong and that was easy to understand. And of course the rare cards, and this is rare relative just to how common the other cards were, were also holographic, adding an extra touch of wow and pizzazz. We'd trade these things with each other and grow our collections in our card binders and just enjoy looking at them. Maybe we would even try to draw the card artwork ourselves or design our own Pokemon cards. Maybe we'd come up with our own game based on the cards or use our cards as an accessory during a game of pretend. When you're young, you don't really need a lot because your imagination does the rest. And the social aspect of trading and the first real experience a lot of us got with status tied to market value made us feel important, grown up and empowered. Simple pieces of cardstock provided hours of fun and stories that we would remember for the rest of our lives. As a youngster, I amassed a hefty collection, and each of these cards was like a power fantasy packed into two dimensions. Nothing I got on my own was rare or valuable, of course, since the vast majority of early Pokemon cards are so common you could fill the mass of the moon with them. But they have sentimental value to me. Unfortunately though, for a while the mystique was somewhat shattered because I have just too darn many of them to get excited about what's in my collection anymore. When you have a small collection or a mid-sized one, every card has an exciting story about how you bargained for it, or pulled a rare right out of a pack on your birthday, and you were the coolest kid in your whole town for a year. But when kids start giving you their entire binders of Pokemon cards in middle school because their parents have figured out that the cards are virtually worthless as collectibles, and your friends don't care about the series anymore, it ends up being kind of bittersweet. Yeah, I have all of these Shadowless cards, but it's because someone I used to be friends with decided that they were garbage, and I was essentially dumpster diving. Not very powerful or cool. But in the last few years, you guys have brought back a lot of the fun by sending me so many cards of my favorites to my P.O. box, and even some truly amazing collector's pieces. So thanks everyone who has sent some cards in, because now I have some fun stories about how I got these guys again, like the viewer who sent in a Carvana with a note that it came swimming back. As I mentioned, I never learned to play the TCG back then, because the game itself never actually caught on as a thing that people knew how to play at my elementary school. People mostly learned how to play Yu-Gi-Oh! It was a lot less messy and required a lot less extra stuff, and more of the cards were based on cool monsters rather than boring energies or items. The Pokemon TCG at least requires damage counters, and more and more of them as the years went on, and some kind of token to keep track of status, and there were so many piles of cards to keep track of and keep separate. With Yu-Gi-Oh there were smaller decks, you might need a coin for a coin flip, but keeping track of life points usually could be done with a pen and paper or a smartphone, or even a basic calculator. Not as many things to carry around. I remember Yu-Gi-Oh matches could be pulled off waiting for class to start. If you set up a Pokemon game in that time, it would be way too much of a hassle. It wasn't until I got to high school that I learned that I had somehow never known about a Pokemon trading card game Game Boy game. Developed by Hudson Soft and released in North America in 2000, this game is a handy companion to the physical TCG, or maybe even an entire substitute for it. The premise of the game is pretty similar to a mainline Pokemon game. You go through a few locations, each with a Pokemon club, and collect the club symbols by beating the club leaders in TCG matches. So pretty much the same thing, just with cards instead of monsters. When you beat all the club masters, you are a bona fide TCG champion. You get handed a starter deck that's absolutely atrocious, and you have to earn cards by winning matches to get better cards to modify it and customize it to be your very own, and actually useful. It's not too fancy, but it certainly does the job. It reuses some sprites from the mainline Game Boy games, and in the overworld you can move super fast! Whee! Matches themselves can either last 5 minutes or a half hour depending on how the RNG treats you, so you get plenty of bang for your buck out of the experience. And the digitized card artwork is high quality and superb. The music is some of the catchiest in the series as well. You play this once and you'll be humming the battle theme for the rest of your life. Plus, one 40-ish dollar Game Boy cart with three whole virtual complete card expansions is a much cheaper way to collect them all than trying to get all of the cards in real life. 
You can even trade them and play matches with other people who have the game. So honestly, if you don't feel like setting up and cleaning up an entire match, this is a good alternative. The game teaches you how to play the actual real card game. And unlike other similar video game translations for other card games at the time, what's in the game was a totally good place to start in terms of learning how to play. These days, you're much better off trying out the TCG Online, since a lot of new mechanics have been layered in on top of the original game. But if you want the whole adventure too, and to learn the OG format, the TCG Game Boy game is available on Virtual Console on 3DS. There are some minor changes in the current format compared to the OG game, but it wouldn't be difficult to catch up. So some people even suggest starting with the Game Boy game today. I played the Yu-Gi-Oh game Dark Duel Stories, and that was a butchered version of the Yu-Gi-Oh format that existed at the time that was based on the anime or manga, so it couldn't even teach you how to play Yu-Gi-Oh back then, and it definitely couldn't stand the test of time to teach you how to play the modern format, which has changed so dramatically. So I consider it pretty good that the Pokemon TCG Game Boy game holds up in that regard compared to its peers, and it's a fun world to explore on its own that makes you want to improve. I never really had anyone in my life that both had the trading cards and knew how to play the game, so it is nice to have a few enthusiastic computer opponents there whenever you feel like playing. The Pokemon trading card game on Game Boy was also the Western world's introduction to one strange character, Imakuni. Imakuni in this game is kind of like a mini-boss, and he has his own strange Pokemon card that you would never be able to use viably in the real game. Back in the before times, it was hard to find info about the original Japanese version of the Pokemon anime if you were a fan in the West. Unlike other localized anime at the time which would originally get Japanese releases on DVD, the localized version of Pokemon was released as its own product without a subtitled version available, probably because 4Kids or Biz, or both, didn't want to pay for the licenses to the original Japanese music, and preferred to make their own music for other localizations to pay licensing fees for. Ironically, it was much easier to find the Japanese music back in the day on the internet than it was to find episodes of the show in Japanese, because mp3 files were way smaller than video clips and easier to host. So a lot of us would download these songs off the Wild West early internet and have to be content with just imagining what the Japanese version of the show was like. It was nice then that a band named Suzuki-san was responsible for creating a ton of the music for the Japanese show, and these songs had so much personality and were themselves self-contained little stories. What's this formation? Imakuni, Kobayashi, Raymond, me? Such a strange combination! Who are we? A super unit sensation! Suzuki-san! Of course, they also raised way more questions than they answered. Who were Imakuni, Kobayashi, and Raymond? They're introduced almost as if we're already supposed to know them. That is, of course, because they existed outside of the Pokemon anime. Imakuni is a musician that has primarily done work for Pokemon that I know of, appears here in this game and a few others, and does a ton of TCG promotion even to this day. Raymond is Raymond Johnson, a German-born, American-raised Japanese television personality who appears in the Japanese children's morning show Ohasta. Ohasta is produced by Showpro, the same producers that brought us the Pokemon anime, and featured frequent recurrent segments about Nintendo and Pokemon products. Funnily enough, Raymond also appears in a Game Boy Color game, based on Ohasta itself, aptly titled Ohasta, Yamachan, and Raymond. This is a simple yet addictive puzzle game with a quirky story where you can play as Raymond himself. So there you go, that's one more Game Boy Color game that's loosely in the Pokemon canon that you never knew about. Does Kobayashi have her own game too? What's her story outside of Suzuki-san? I'd love to know. Very little English language internet material exists to answer this question. I've gotten very off track though, so let's get back to the TCG. I've been mostly positive about this game so far, but I have a confession to make. Even completely without taking modern iterations of the card game into consideration, I just flat out do not like the Pokemon trading card game at its core. I may not like any deck building card games. Actually, I'm not even sure if I like playing cards at all, except Uno. And it's hard to put my finger on exactly what it is that bothers me so much. The Pokemon trading card game, or at least the iteration that appears in the Game Boy game, is extremely luck-based. It comes down to the luck of the draw, opening packs to get good cards, then there's skill and strategy putting a deck together, but then once the deck is built, it's down to what you happen to draw in your hand and whether you happen to win more coin flips than your opponent. And this is worse than the Game Boy Color game, because unlike being able to pay to win in real life with buying as many card packs as you want, in the Game Boy Color game you have to win matches to get new packs, and until you have enough cards to work with to build a deck that rules out as many elements of chance as possible, winning comes down to coin flips. 
It's not that I dislike RNG mechanics on principle, though. I love team building in the Pokemon video game, and even persisting in games like Stadium against unfair teams built on chance elements like one-hit KO or status. There's a degree of RNG involved in the team building process, too. I'll soft reset for hours, months, years, just rolling the numbers over and over again to try to get the desired outcome in the video game. I've had shiny hunts last most of a year. I've done the Professor Oak challenge in Leaf Green where you have to get two Moonstones as held items off of Wild Clefairy. I've searched for 1% encounter chances for hours. And yet, I don't like it when the same luck-based mechanics are applied to the card game. I typically do these things in the video game because I feel rewarded for my patience. So where does all that patience go for the TCG? I can't shake the this is unfair feeling I get when I play it. And I wonder if it's because I'm not opting in of my own free will to the system. I mean, I am opting in by choosing to play the game at all. But it's not the same kind of choice as choosing to shiny hunt in a game that's main mechanic set isn't really about shiny hunting. I can choose to persist in the video game to get the exact team I want. In the TCG, the deck feels more stacked against you. Ha. Huh. You have much less control over how many chances you get for more cards. In the video game, when things start going badly during a match, there's always some hope that you can play your way back into turning it around in your favor. In the TCG, when things are going badly, it's because they were always going to go badly from the start because your deck isn't good enough, or you were just never going to win more coin flips than the opponent, and you just have to sit there and watch your deck lose until it's over. I mean, you can have an objectively better deck than your opponent and still lose because you just didn't get the right draws. There's a beginner's hurdle in this game that I never really experienced in real life, since I started playing the actual TCG years after starting to build a collection, and just already having all the cards I needed to work with. Starting with a crappy theme deck in this game and not having enough of anything to work with to outplay the specialized NPC decks that they all have is frustrating. The game starts you with a single Bill and Professor Oak each, and it fills out your deck with a million basics without their full evil lines that span across three typings. There was a point where I couldn't even consistently beat the guy that gives you more energies, and even then the energies I got were not the ones I needed. And I think maybe I don't enjoy the deck building aspect of the game as much, because it makes me not want to use all the cards that I like the most, the Pokemon themselves. You usually want to build a deck around as few basic Pokemon and evolutions as possible, because you need to be able to consistently draw a good mixture of useful items, basic Pokemon, and energies. Which means I can't roleplay with team building like I could in the video game. In those games, I can make as many combinations of types and species as I want, catch as many or few as I want, and use them in any combination together. In the TCG, there are good cards and there are bad cards, and there are cards that work together and cards that don't. You're going to ultimately end up with whatever deck eliminates as much of the unpredictability of a match as possible, and that means you'll never get to enjoy a wide variety of species or styles or types in one deck. I can't theorize a trainer and imagine how they caught these Pokemon with all this beautiful card artwork, because the world building of the TCG begins and ends there and is totally separate from the actual gameplay. I guess I'm one of those weirdos that enjoys chess more than war. Anyway, I'm bad at this game, my endless patience for so many aspects of Pokemon is just not there, and I have this nagging unfair feeling that makes me sad and frustrated the whole time I'm playing. Obviously this game is just not for me, and I feel bad for the TCG fans watching this video and hearing a bunch of common complaints that are just not a big deal in the grand scheme. Don't worry, I feel the same way when I hear people list reasons that they don't like JRPGs. Some people probably do feel rewarded for persevering, or maybe modern iterations of the game have smoothed out some of these common irritations. But if you're not like me, and you do like card games, or just have never tried the Pokemon TCG and are curious about what it was like in the beginning, the Game Boy game is a fun place to start. It's not too slow paced and gives you lots of computers to practice against, and thankfully it's pretty easily available these days. I do have one quick announcement before I sign off for today. In my last video I mentioned that I applied for a bunch of jobs at the beginning of the year before coronavirus hit, and in the last week one of those companies has hired me for a temporary position. So although the timing is somewhat hilarious, I'm going to end up taking most of next month off. But don't worry, I'll be back as soon as I can. Anyway, see ya in December.